नमस्कार श्री राम जी वेलकम वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन थैंक यू सो मच फॉर मेकिंग टाइम जी तो कैन वी बिगिन विद योर अर्लीस्ट मेमोरी फ्रॉम चाइल्डहुड ऑफ हाउ यू रिमेम्बर फर्स्ट एवर either hearing about the idea or having an experience that uh, alerted you to the concept of ahimsa hmm very good question i basically think it was reading and i basically i think it was the life and of mahatma gandhi and you know examples from there i um, mean i think that's where i got my first glimpse of uh, uh, well, it's a very very interesting question i'm trying to No, no. Please I, take your time. No, I also remember that um, you know during the years in school when I was I was in a boarding school, um, and that was a boarding school where uh, discipline was left to the head boy and the prefects. and this was the hyderabad public school and i happened to be head boy um so i think in a boarding school it's very difficult for the head boy to practice the doctrine of ahimsa and why is that so well <clears throat> you can practice the doctrine but you cannot appear to practice the doctrine indeed so while you may temper your punishments um and you know um uh, not go out of balance uh and make sure you know people know exactly why they have to undergo any kind of punishment and to explain as to why what they did which was wrong <clears throat> and <clears throat> and like this is not the way you should treat um a fellow student or the kitchen staff whatever um so while the actual handling of the situation could well have the markings of ahimsa uh, it doesn't do well to be known as a practitioner of ahimsa then you just get more people Who, who who you know do the wrong thing mm. so i um the sense that i'm getting is that you were striving for restorative justice uh, that's a term that is used very much now in 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 global uh, context yeah that I, where we are trying to replace that non violence means that we replace retributional justice or just raw punishment with that which enables the person to restore themselves to society is that what you're referring to yeah i think it's something which when you you do it and then you look back or stand back and look at it uh you say yes the way this is being handled is good for both is good for the person who's cast as the aggressor or Uh, you know who's done something not right uh is good for the other person and is good for their relationship because it's not enough i think just to dispose of that particular incident uh, it also must be disposed of in a way which you know uh, makes it possible for both sides to build a better relationship that's very fascinating because recently we had a guest in this series who uh, runs a non violence program in the schools of rhode island in the us mm. and this is exactly what she said she said that 
the purpose of that program is to in after there has been a conflict to mm. enable different sides of that conflict to heal and to restore so did this uh, role as head boy in a sense prepare you or you know lay the ground for your becoming uh, a mediation expert because the conventional lawyer thrives on disputes not getting settled and going on and on in court for ages so how did you get drawn uh, I, i mean can you say more about what drew you to this field well <clears throat> i don't know whether any seed was laid during my term in school um and i'm also thinking of years i was in college because while at college at government law college i again was you know head, head of the students union um i think what those two leadership positions gave me was the idea that you must take everybody along you know um uh, you must take everybody along uh, you must conduct things in such a way that um where i think actually you know a a, a good coexistence um there is much to be said for a peaceful coexistence um and i think when i held those two leadership positions i was come somewhere intuitively practicing that um although i must tell you that my choice of the law as a career um originated simply from a love of the concept of justice um i don't know any you know restorative or there's any any other thing i i just knew that um uh, justice was something a concept uh, to which i was deeply attracted hmm. and was just uh, sorry go ahead go ahead so yes i'm going to answer your question i know what it is um so um i joined the bar in 1976 yes in the year 1983 well but well, yes in the year 1983 i had an attack of poliomyelitis i had gone up mountain climbing uh from kulu chandarkani pass and i picked up a very rare polio virus uh, which affected both my hands the shoulders and my right leg and i was paralyzed for uh, six months and more and you know and then got back to to try to learn how to walk again um there were lots of things i couldn't do and still can't do um uh, but the almighty has been good i mean he's given me enough functioning for me to you know function fully i mean i i, I can work as hard as anybody else i travel a lot i can drive a car the only things i can't do are play tennis and hockey but you know i played a lot of those before um i think that that illness that you know uh, which is the really and uh, the, i still bear you know the residue of that i still have i think that changed the way i was looked at things um prior to that i was well on the path of being a very successful corporate lawyer commercial corporate lawyer um but a lot of things changed professionally after that about uh, uh, polymolysis 
because I continue to practice law and I continue to do conventional law, but I have always done other things in addition. And in the 80s, I set up one of India's first consumer and environmental groups. It's called the Consumer Action Group. Uh, it's quite strong in Chennai. Um, and I was one of the first to get into public interest litigation. Um, so I've always, you know, done something more than just conventional law. And this ties in actually with, with, with my work at mediation because um, in 1990 or 91, I went to the Salzburg seminar. And, uh, you know, the Salzburg seminar is, I think, for the majority of people who attend it, it's a life changing experience. Um, it's, it's a seminar, you know, they hold it for two weeks. They're multiple seminars. They, so it can be in any aspect, you know, it could be politics or law or history or journalism or writing or whatever. Uh, but they bring in um, mid-career uh, professionals um, who are working in that field and they throw them in with uh, two or three, you know, top rate of knowledge experts. So the, the seminar I went for was harmonizing environment and development conflict. Uh, because I was doing case, I was litigating on those matters. And Dr. M.S. Swaminathan thought that um, it may be good to me to, you know, go to the seminar. So he sponsored me. And I went and I spent uh, two weeks there. This, incidentally, this is, Sol I mean, um, um, Salzburg, of course, is Mozart's birthplace, but it's also the place where this film, The Sound of Music, was filmed. Was shot, yes. And we actually stayed in that castle, which was the home of that family, mm -hmm. the Von Trapp family. Harmonizing environment and development, and what Lauren Suskind and Chris Moore and the others spoke about was to use the concept of mediation to harmonize, harmonize these two uh, environment and development conflicts. I'd never heard of mediation. But I was at that stage in my career uh, deeply dissatisfied. Dissatisfied because um, of the damage done by litigation. Um, not only loss in terms of, you know, time, money, that kind of thing but simply the damage done to relationships. And the damage done internally, you know. So many cases I could see is scarring, like internal hemorrhage, if you compare it to the medical thing. Um, and people who have to fight for, you know, for many years, and for some, it becomes the most in, important thing in their lives. You know. um, so this this upset me. As I said, I'm passionate about the law, so it deeply upset me to find that while the law has its codes, and we we worked out systems for you know, uh, which are technically very good, giving people every opportunity, trying to hold the balance. But the point was that it's not how good your, your, your code of procedure works. The point was that everything 
the Lord does was adversary. So it's not a question of intentions or you know wanting to treat people bad, you know, badly or being falling short in some account. It was simply the problem that we were subjecting every conflict to adversarial treatment. And therefore perpetrating violence on ourselves and on the other. Am I right? Violence on ourselves, violence on the others, violence on the next generation. Uh, violence all around. And I would dare say violence to the court as well. Um, you know, if the court didn't have to handle so many cases uh, like this, the court could be doing other things much faster and better. So Salzburg, I think, was was where the you know the penny dropped in the slot, and I said, "My God, this is what I'm looking for." Because this gives me a way um, where one can utilize the adversarial process for a particular kind of case, cases, you know, uh, where you need to, um, where a court has to interpret something or, or a case calls for real punishment. Um, or there is a severe imbalance of power, or something is done is so wrong which you should not really mediate it. You, know, you need the court, you need the, the, the corrective arm of the court. But a whole lot of cases are not like that. A whole lot of cases are cases where people have simply fallen into conflict. Sorry, are just falling into conflict. Uh, people have uh, where, uh, a whole lot of cases are cases where people have basically just fallen into conflict. You know, something misinterpreted, uh, you know, basically relationship and transactional relationship difficulties. Um, Whether it's someone who can't keep his side of the contract because of factors he didn't plan for. I, where essentially, you know, you just ask yourself one question. Um, for this dispute, is it possible for these two to sit and talk about it and, and reach a solution? Um, and if they do, then yes, this is good for mediation. So you see what what helped me was I came away uh, with a very neat sense of appropriate dispute resolution. This bulk of cases is for the court. These kind of cases should go to arbitration, and these cases should go to mediation. How did you how do you tell the difference? So for court you mark out cases which need an authoritative interpretation of the law of the law or cases where you need the direction of a court um, cases where the imbalance is too much between the parties in terms of the power imbalance yeah Cases where you can see bad faith and cases where, you know, it will shock your social conscience to have it mediated. I mean, I would not mediate a case where uh, somebody who adulterates baby food asks me, you know, will you mediate this case because I would say no. Um, so where you need, as I said, the, you know, the corrective arm of the court.
lots of cases which where government is involved because it's very difficult to negotiate with government. You know, they are, it's not easy. Um, and very something needs an application of the law. Mm. So I would mark out all those, and of course, serious criminal cases also. And for arbitration, I think you take the cases where the kind of cases which need a lot of evidence, technical matters, which need a lot of evidence. Um, although now we are, we are setting up ways of merging uh, mediation and arbitration. Okay. <clears throat> um, and we, 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 so after litigation, after arbitration, pretty much best cases are suitable for mediation. And what volume of cases in India would qualify then for this category of mediation? Because one of our bigger issues, uh, 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 which has become a kind of cause of structural injustice, is the mismatch between the volume or the total volume of cases and the capacity of the courts. So what roughly what percentage is handleable through mediation? Um, <clears throat> you know, I don't have figures to offer. <clears throat> I know now that just by running um, court annex mediation centers. Um, I mean, lakhs of cases are resolved. Yeah. Which is a small, which is not a significant percentage when you come to, um, when you see the number of cases that are there. Mm. But if I look at the rate of growth, I mean that nobody talked of mediation before 2005. And in barely 15 years, we have a few thousand mediators. We, you know, they resolve lakhs of cases. Um, so if I look ahead, and this is what I told my, uh, you know, my my family of mediators. I said, you know, we should give us 10 years time. But in that 10 years, we should work things in such a way that the majority of conflict comes to us. That the majority of, you know, personal matters, matrimonial matters, uh, commercial matters, civil disputes, property disputes. Um, the majority should come to us, not to the courts. Yeah. I said, you know, the, this was at a, at a meeting where we were talking about how much it had progressed. Um, but I said, that's fine. It's nice to pat ourselves in our backs, but this is the this is our agenda. The next ten years, we should be the ones handling most of it. Hmm. How do you define justice in this situation? I mean, I think what you have established is that conflict is a reality in life, but it need, it need, need not lead to either personal or group violence. Therefore, um, mediation is a method for uh, moving a conflict situation towards justice. But, and I, I sensed in what you said that you're equating justice with fairness. Um, but could you explain that a bit more, um, how that works? That's a very good question, you know, because uh, the connection between mediation and justice. And fairness. Uh, in fairness. Um, look at it this way. You have two people who have a dispute and it goes to a court and the judge delivers a verdict. 
and that's justice. Nobody will say no to that. Now look at this case where these two people have it mediated and they come to a solution which both of them accept as being as being fair, uh, as being practical, um, and taking into account everything. Okay. They're not just looking at the letter of the law like the judge does, but they're taking everything into account, including themselves, their families, their capacities, their health, their, you know, how much money they have to fight, everything. And they arrive at a, at a solution and say, okay, we'll accept this. Um, and, and to me, that's justice too. In fact, it you know, seems to me, too. it seems to me that it's a, actually a deeper form of justice because in this case, there's no loser. Whereas uh, in, the, in the classic case, uh, where a verdict is handed out by a judge, uh, one of the two parties feels like a loser. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Now, what is fascinating is that you have been in a situation where these, uh, this approach, these uh, ideals were applied to a very, very famous and a very crucial public conflict, uh, the, the Ayodhya case. So before we go into the details of the Ayodhya situation, as much as it is possible for you to reveal, because I, I understand uh, that you're constrained as a party to that, uh, uh, of that panel, uh, in how much you can share in the public. But how does, how in your experience, if you could tell maybe first a few other incidents where you've used this wisdom to approach uh, conflicts that are not just between two individuals. You know, there's a classic story we have in mediation when we teach it. And this is about two girls fighting over an orange. Now, a judge will go into the question of, you know, where did this tree grow? Did it grow on the land of this one or on this one? Uh, if it is an overhang, then, you know, what is the test we apply to that? Um, and that's, the, that's how the law will tell him to decide. An arbitrator may say, well, let's do 50-50. Let's do 50 okay. Half for this one, half for the other one. A mediator will ask one question, which is, I think, the mediator's main question. And he'll say, why do you want this? And may turn out that one girl will say, I want the, you know, I want the, the orange so I can make juice. And the other girl will say, I want the skin because I want to make marmalade. I want the rind so that I can make marmalade. And this way, both of them get 100% of what they want. The important thing is, there is somebody who both trust and therefore to that person will they will they will answer when he says why do you want this and i tell you that one question why do you want this can make things so totally different um and i tell people when i speak it i said look at every case of yours and look at the understanding you will have if you ask this question, why do you want this? Because a lot of times, two people will fight over the same thing. 
but for different reasons. Yeah, but I have a feeling that it is in how you ask the question that uh, the outcome depends. Because if the same question is asked in a very, even a hint of judgment. So can you share something about uh, the, the ground that you prepare, maybe in your own mind, in your own heart, before you pose that question? You know, I mediated a border dispute between Assam and Nagaland way back in 2011. Uh, it's a dispute for the land running right north to south, about 500 square kilometers. And initially, you know, we were hopeful of, you know, actually a full, 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 full rate settlement, but. Um, Government of India then did the conclave transfers of Bangladesh. They didn't take the people of Assam into you know, confidence. So when that happened, Assam erupted. And I think then it became very difficult for them to, you know, to do large scale border transfers. But that's another classic example of, you know, why do you want this land? Because well, I won't tell you who I was speaking to. I was speaking to very uh, people in high authority. Um, um, one side would say, I want this land because it's my constitutional territory. I can't lose it. And you speak to the, you know, chief people on the other side. And you ask the same question, why do you want this land? Which, of course, let me tell you, the minute, the first time I asked this question, they all think I'm mad. You know, what the hell is this? We've been in court for so long. What is this man asking us why we want it? But I would persist in saying, never mind. Just tell me, why do you want it? And the other side would say, you know, we don't have land on the plains. We are a hilly state. We want this land because we want to use it. And unfortunately, national politics, I think, and this thing prevented us from reaching good agreements. Otherwise, it's not difficult to work out a trusteeship concept where somebody can continue to own what he owns and the other person could use it. Mm. Mm. You know? Mm. But all this comes from that question why? Why do you want this? Yeah. Ever run to a situation where you are faced with either or party, either one or both, basically saying that they want it because they just don't want the other fellow to have it. There is, there are moments in life when there is that kind of uh, antipathy towards whoever is deemed to be the opponent, and in, in a sense, that's actually one of the reasons for so much violence in the world. So you have to ask the question again. You have to say, why don't you want that person to have it? You know, you have to unravel it. Um, and very often you would hear people and sometimes I tell parties, I said, look, you know, you're giving me this saga of your disappointment and emotion, and being let down, etc. I said, let me tell you that I heard the same thing five minutes back from your, from the other side. You know, you get a lot of mirrored uh, emotions, but you have to let them talk. So, Ayodhya was, I mean, Ayodhya was a fascinating case to mediate. You know, all my mediator friends, world over, insanely jealous. <laughs> because this case had everything, you know, it, it had, uh, had importance. Uh, it was 
crucial for the relationship between the communities. It had a history. There was law. There was property. There was property. So it had everything, you know, and it had loss of human life. And it took its, you know, it took its, um, we were very close to a settlement at one point. And even at the end, there was a settlement between, you know, significant parties, but not everybody. But I think some things came through. You know, the first thing that gladdens me is that contrary to expectations, there was no loss of life after the judgment. There was no violence, no loss of life. If somebody had, and I had no shortage of people telling me when I was appointed, saying, look, you've got into something which is going to result in a bloodbath. But there was no loss of life. People criticize you know, the judgment where the court held that uh, the Hindus could prove title. And yes, I can see the criticism in that. One has to answer the bigger questions and that's what you do in a mediation. You know, you, you make people enlarge their perspective. Mm. So when you say, why is this land important to you. One side may say, well, because I want to build my house of worship. And I'm now talking very generally, I'm not talking about Ayodhya. One side might say, well, I want to build my house of worship. And when you ask the other side, why is this land important to you? That side might say, you know, if I give up this, I'm going to be asked to give up more. So if you protect me from that, then this is not such a big issue. So I'm, I'm speaking very generally and you know, you'll know why I'm doing that. So that again, you know, is back to the question, why? Yeah. And at the end, at the end of the day, you know, you take any case, I mean, you will meet people and you will think before you meet them that, oh, this is a very, uh, you know, as a mediator, I've learned not to label people, not to form judgmental opinions. But it's amazing when people actually open out to you, you know. You, you always see, you know, a, a good side. It comes through. It comes through, you know, they open out and talk to you. I think the biggest thing, you know, in the, for, for a mediator uh, is to be trusted. And that is so important. So How do you that build that trust? I think you build it um, you have to build it with, with with years of work you know and a reputation um, you build it by treating people fairly, you know. Um, 
And once people see that, you know, then they relax, they're comfortable. Um, they have no problem when you tell them that, look, I don't think you have a great case. Uh, when I have to do that, I will basically do it with both parties. I will tell both parties, and I, you know, in 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 in, a, in, a separate, in separate meetings. And I will I will even take 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 apart their cases. You know, say I'll tell you five reasons why you're going to lose. Um, so long as they trust you, they'll take it for you. Um, and I think that trust is not just about honesty and competence. I think it's very important that they get from you this, that they get this feeling of this man wants to help me. It kind of, you're saying you, you have to build a sense of security. Yeah. Because in, in a lot of research is showing that both physical and, and non-physical violence has its root in fear. The yeah. fear that whoever I perceive to be the other Correct. will be advantaged over me. Yeah. Yeah. So it is that feeling, you know, I'm safe in his hands. So sometimes, you know, when things don't move well, um, I will just say, fine, we are at 4.30. I will close this by 5. And you can go back and face the judge tomorrow. I've had enough of you. Go away now, think. Your time only till 5. Every time I've done that, we will come back and say, sir, there's one more idea. Can we talk about it? Because, you know, it's all very well. I give them this, this uh, area of comfort. And they're quite happy to, you know, exist in that. But sometimes, yes, one has to give them some cold water treatment. <laughs> you know, in an article you wrote about your uh, Ayodhya mediation experience, you made a very interesting point about how there is a combination of centripetal and centrifugal uh, energies that operate in a conflict. And that how at the very at the peak of a conflict, all the energy is at opposite spectrums. How in, in a social and, and in a sense political context, how does this dynamic operate? What signs of hope do you see? Uh, perhaps even for situations where, you know, it's not a neatly defined matter that can come to the table literally, but um, as, as, and, and I don't have to enumerate how many such conflicts we are grappling with as a society. So can you explain what is this dynamic? I think just understanding it will help us all. It's the dynamic and the power of violence. Uh, It's the dynamic of how attractive violence can be. Extractive? A attractive. Attractive. How, how, you know, actually appealing it can be, how, how attractive it can be. Um, and violence has a certain magnetism. No. Um, and
and a reflex, you know, a reflexive um, response. It has that. So, and because it is violent, it, it's, it scares people who want to think and speak otherwise. You mean scares in terms of fear of personal harm? Fear of personal harm. Uh, fear of being targeted. So there is that inbuilt kind of, you know, threat. I really wish I could talk about Ayodhya, but I can't. When you do a public, public matter, mediate a public matter, you will see this range. You will see this range of, of people who've been violent, who want to have, you know, the power to be violent. You will see people who, who dread this violence. And you will see people who naturally, you know, want to get along. Um, and you will see some uh, and you come across some amazing things. You, you, you cast somebody in some mold and then one fine day you have to you just have to admit that you are so wrong one of our ideas for this dispute was that I mean as I told you the Supreme Court held that the Hindus have the title to the land and it also placed the protection of places of worship act uh, it the court held that that forms part of the basic structure of the Constitution and therefore it can't be it can't be taken away we were also you know thinking that and parties agreed that one outcome of all this should be setting up of an institution for for social and religious harmony And quite a few parties put their signatures to that. I think I'd write a book, you know, to talk about who are the people who wanted to contribute to this institution, the social harmony. I mean, it was, I'm sorry, Rajni, I have to hold back too many things. So a very important quality of the mediator then is the willingness to keep an open mind about the people involved in the situation. Always. And that if, if you lock your view of that person, you will miss new, more nuanced, uh, more subtle messages about the person that you will only get if you keep a, an open perspective and, uh, you know, keep all your uh, frequencies, in a sense, receptive. 
that's a that's what i hear you saying yeah i think so because i think if you treat somebody well they respond well to you yeah um i think maybe we each have 100 you know we have we are different to each person with whom we interact um so if you treat somebody well i think they will they will treat you well and it doesn't mean that you know it must end up in a positive agreement or whatever um sometimes you know people try their best but something doesn't work out uh, but if i may just go back uh, for a minute to this earlier point um isn't it also that the process of mediation itself enables people to tap parts of themselves that may otherwise have been buried or sidelined or not expressed for fear of seeming weak so it so seems to am i right you're absolutely right um because when you in many mediations what i hear from the parties will have very little connection with what the case pleadings are very little connection it's a different language it's a different foundation um, is it kind know, of like the back story like the the back story the background no they can be you know what what's you know what started a conflict um <clears throat> how somebody felt i give you give you an instance um father and son i mean they were heading a big big empire uh came and said look we we've, we've decided to separate we don't want your mediation on that we only want you to help us how to divide our assets that's all that's fine so i mean we started that and at one point i father is sitting in front of me and i said look you're not telling me the whole story so he said he said my son never said sorry for sorry for so i said you better tell me because nowhere in the pleadings do i read anything about anyone having to say sorry so he said look you i built up this this empire and you know i sent my son to you know harvard or cornell or something and he came back and he joined the board and he said on the board are all my chums you know my friends they're all on the board and we were discussing something and my son basically said that i don't know much about the subject and it should be left to him he said he made made me look small in front of my friends and he never said sorry so i let him finish and then i spoke to the son 
and brought him round to this. And I said, do you remember that meeting? He said, yes. I said, what did you say? And he said, he said, well, you know, I was talking about the benefits to the company. So I said, is it possible that by what you said and the way you said, you could also be belittling your father in front of his friends? So he said, I never meant that. So I said, I want you to tell your father this. Are you willing to do that? He said, yes. Huh? So I then did something which I normally never do. I put the two adversaries in the same room and I left the room. <clears throat> After 15 minutes, these two step out and they said, you know, thank you very much, but we don't need your help because we are not dividing our empire. He never said sorry. So every case, I mean, many cases are like that. Yeah. What is the driver for this conflict? It's only when they start talking. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, in the converse of this, have you also seen situations where all efforts to create this kind of uh, meeting ground fail and then the conflict just continues to spiral downward? Do you face those situations also? Yeah, you've had situations where they, they don't come uh, to an agreement. Sometimes, you know, that can be really bad. Uh, sometimes the fact that they just sat at the table together has worsened things. That can be very bad. But there are any number of cases where they go through a round of mediation, it doesn't work, and they go back to court, and at some stage they come back to mediation. Uh, because they've, they've had this kind of taste of it. Um, so there are quite a few cases which come back to mediation. And in fact, I tell people um, when something doesn't settle, I say, look, you know, you've traveled a long way. Uh, you haven't traveled far enough. But uh, mediation's doors are always open to you. And there are plenty of cases which settle six months down the line. Because you never know actually when a case will settle. I think all cases, disputes, I think, have their own karma. <laughs> yeah. They have their date of birth and they have a life. And there is a date when that dispute must die. Yeah. Can we come back to the contrast that you have drawn between the sentry petal and the centrifugal forces? Uh, either whichever level you feel comfortable talking about it. Uh, of course, I must confess that uh, at, when I ask this question, my primary focus is on the larger atmosphere of conflict and polarization in society. And uh, at an, you know, we are all facing situations in, in everyday life, in families where uh, this feeling of polarization and I mean, where actually there isn't even any tangible dispute. Uh, but I see this dynamic working, where as you said, it's like there's a chakra view. Uh, well, maybe that's the wrong term, but there's like a whirlwind which is pushing people 
to two opposite extremes uh, so what broad observe, you know what broad insights can you share which will help all of us in in just our everyday uh, grappling with this time we live in and it's a global reality it's not limited to india yeah You know, one can see it. You have an incident or situation, something goes wrong. And then you have the raised voices on both sides. And those voices are can be very loud and rancorous. We have not built up we have not built up the strategy you know, for the harmonizing middle. The harmonizing middle. Um, so that, you know, for quickly something to be written uh, in, in the media about a better way of resolving this. Uh, for the media for it for, to focus on interviews. You know, and to ask this question, isn't there a better way? Um, why does this happen? You mean uh, the conflict? Uh, there is a better way. Um, so we have, we have all, you know, actually failed in uh, it's like you know Barcelona plays Real Madrid and uh, when Barcelona takes up the offensive the five Real Madrid defenders just stand by quietly because we know we know what is going to happen um, I think we have to think very seriously of how do you rival uh, and match um, polarization. Sorry, how do you? How do you rival it? How do you match it? How do you treat it? How do you better it? Yeah. It's like I enjoying I'm enjoying that you're using those terminologies rather than antidote. Because antidote would be another opposite. You mentioned the harmonizing middle, and yet you have also been known to quote Rumi's famous uh, lines out beyond the ideas of wrongdoing and right doing, there is a field. I will meet you there. You have quoted this in some of your writings. So how does this, your, your appreciation for Rumi's words match or how does it shape or inform your search for the harmonizing middle? Are they two different things? I think that's where also we want to, you know, to take people um, I mean, when their conversation is all about, you know, I'm right, you're wrong. And if that is the nature of the conversation, 
where there's very little you can do. So you have to take them to another place. Where they understand that my continuing this conversation of right and wrong is harmful to me. You know, that it's not doing me any good. And people in mediation, I say, I say, look, I'm not asking you to sacrifice anything. You know, I'm not asking you to sacrifice. But what I am saying is, I will bring you to a certain point, which is the point of the best possible agreement this can yield. And then it's your job. You look at this and you look at where you're going to be if you don't reach agreement. And you decide which is better for you. That's not my business. I just bring you to that point. You decide which is better for you. Don't do it for me. Don't do me. Don't do a favor. For you know, uh, uh, you're not doing me a favor by settling this case. You look at your own interest. The only thing I'm saying is an enlightened self-interest is what I want you to practice. Where you open up the perspective and you keep in mind the consequences of, you know, not settling. That is an enlightened self-interest. It's interesting. It's almost as though you are encouraging people to first of all be trustees of their own well-being. Yeah. You know, yeah. As opposed to, in a sense, uh, recklessly uh, mm -hmm. putting their own happiness and their own well-being in yes. danger. So in closing, what advice would you give to young people today? Young people who are keen to, who want to move beyond the polarization, the conflict, uh, and do it constructively, not by sweeping things under the carpet. Uh, what are some of the qualities? Because I'm fascinated by how calm you are. Uh, because the work you do may would be potentially uh, psychically and psychologically very draining. I can tell you that, you know, I can stand up in court and argue a case for five hours in a day and I wouldn't feel very tired. But when I go through mediations where there's a lot of acrimony, yes, um, at the end of the day, I can be like a limp rag, you know, so they're throwing it all on me. Um, I don't know about calmness or uh, it's nice to, it's nice to hear you say that I uh, have a calmness. I think I think when you come to mediation and you enter this world and you practice it, I think that comes, it comes, you know, it may help if one actually does some meditation every day, which, um, I'd like to, I'd like to do. Um, but I think once we enter this world of uh, mediation, which is a world where, what are you doing? You're making people's lives better. Yeah. Um, and you have the opportunity to do that. I tell these youngsters, I say, you know, you're so bloody lucky. You're 24 and you're starting a career in mediation. 
and uh, and when i started you know most people thought i was talking about meditation in, in the mid 90s i used to give a talk and people used to come with you know yoga mat rolled up all ready to do some is and it was a hard 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 climb you know um, when we first set it up in madras in 2005 we set up the country's first court and ex center here and we needed some rooms we had two rooms they had in mind and somebody said oh you know these are very nice rooms should we give them for this mediation and one judge said just give it to shri ram no it's his you know it's his pet fancy it won't last beyond 6 months and today i have made that two to we now have 19 um so i think it's a lovely world to be in and it's it's, it's wonderful work to do i mean it can be hard it can be um you know fatiguing it can be frustrating uh but at the end of the day you know when you have um, done something and improved somebody's lives um and i have some lovely stories about people you know talking to people responding after things have been settled um and opening up and you know thanking you and you see the difference you've made to their lives and i'll tell you one uh, one one story if i have time we had started this the center in 2005 and i think we had one two three four five cases and uh no successes and then there was this case about the it was a dispute between a house owner and a contractor who built his house and it had gone into arbitration and the court sent it to 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 mediation and we had two three sittings and we resolved that and then they signed an agreement and uh, the the house owner wrote out a check and gave it to okay as soon as it was done the contractor's wife who had been attending these sessions she drew me aside and she said i want to tell you something sir my husband has cancer and we desperately need this money we couldn't say it during the negotiation because it may give the other side an upper hand but now that we have the money i just want to tell you that you know we will use this for his treatment so i said very good i'm very glad when she left that room she turned around and i can remember this you know with a clarity that i don't have a lot of things she turned around and she said sir this is not any ordinary room it is a house of god and believe you me uh, uh brajni at that point i mean i had doubts about mediation and will it take off will it not it's so different but at that point i knew that this is going to happen that there is no way mediation will not take off in india 5 years later i was driving down one of madras's roads there was a somebody knocked you know the car the car door and asked he to pull up so i i pulled up and this was a couple on a motors motorcycle and the lady said she said sir you you don't recognize us you won't recognize us so we are the couple who came for that mediation in 2005 and i want to tell you that my husband has been treated and he's well and everything is fine with us really 
And I think every mediator has lots of these stories. I'm sure. sure. So, yep. So all the best. Thank you so much. You're welcome.